Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part five of my UML2 video tutorial. Today, I'm going to talk about communication diagrams. However, before you watch this, if you haven't watched the tutorial on sequence diagrams, you should definitely check that out first, and I provide a link above to that, because I'm going to be teaching about communication diagrams by comparing them to the more common sequence diagrams. So let's get into it. Now this presentation is going to be a little bit different than my normal ones because I wanted to do a lot of comparisons. I have to fit everything on the screen. So on the left side of your screen, you see the sequence diagrams, which focus on the order of interactions between the different participants in your program or system. On the right side, you see the communication diagram. A communication diagram is used to show links between participants, and it has four main parts, being the participants, which are the same as you can see right here these two guys here communication links there are no lifelines there are communication links that link the different participants that interact and the messages that are going to be passed and the messages have the same main format as a sequence diagram meaning the message name or the method name any arguments followed by their class separated by a colon and then another colon and the return type and you can see those documented down here and then the fourth part of a communication diagram which is often disregarded is the number which is going to label how all of these different participants are going to interact and how their messages are going to interact. And I'm going to show you this in a big detailed frame, but as you can see here, whenever you create your first message, you're going to just put a number. The second message is just going to increment that. However, once you hit a new participant, you are then going to add an additional number on the end. And then if we would continue to send additional messages from this participant, participant over here, we would increment this second number while leaving the first number as it is. So there you go. It's the links, the participants, the messages, and the message numbers. So let's focus in even further. Here you can see what a nested method looks like inside of a sequence diagram. And what I mean by a nested method is you send a message which causes another message to be sent to another participant. Then there's a response, and maybe then another message is sent, and then another response, and then finally we come back to the original participant. That's what I mean by a nested method. Inside of communication diagram, however, we are going to send message A, then remember Remember, we hit a new participant, so we have to add an additional number, and then we are not going to need to have the return arrows like you see right here because this is just showing the main one-time interaction between the different participants. Now we move on to if multiple messages are executed at the same time. As you can see here with sequence diagrams, we had to surround those by what were called sequence fragments if we wanted to show messages that were sent in parallel. However, with communication diagrams, what we're going to do is just simply add a letter onto this guy. The first message sent in parallel is going to have an A and then a B and then C, D, E, F, G and just keep going on and on and on. I also want to draw your attention to a call to self. With sequence diagrams, you're going to draw a little arrow out that's then going to bounce back. And this will be used to demonstrate an object calling its own method if this specific participant was an object in this situation. However, a call to self with a communication diagram is going to be shown with a box with no arrows. And then you're outside of that box that's going to sort of look like it's laying underneath of this participant. You're going to draw an arrow inside of there, then put a message number and the message itself. And I'm abbreviating these messages just to make everything fit. So those are the different ways to show parallel executions of messages methods using both sequence diagrams and communication diagrams, as well as how call to self differs between the two different types of diagrams. And if it makes more sense to show it in a non-left to right manner, this is another example of a communication diagram nested message. As you see, there's one for the message, hits the second participant, adds another number onto there, sends another message here. If we were going to then send another message from this participant, we would add another number on after that. As you're going to see later on. And as well, here's another way to show parallel method executions using communication diagrams. Just basically have to remember the link between those participants that are interacting and then draw in an arrow based off of who is asking who a specific message. And then you have to draw in an arrow that represents who is sending a message to whatever participant that is in the diagram. Now here I'm going to show you the difference between executing methods multiple times with a sequence diagram. Once again, 
again, you're going to use a sequence fragment with sequence diagrams, just a little box here. And here I'm going to loop through sending this message to this participant 10 times. The same exact thing is going to be done down here with this communication diagram. I'm going to be sending this same message 10 times as well. And in this situation, you're just going to put 0 through 9, representing the first index being a 0. And that is really the only thing that's going to change. You're going to rely less on boxes with communication diagrams and rely more on object constraints as we're going to get to here in a second. You can just see here you're just going to put a star inside of there, a variable equals, and then how many times you want to loop through. That's basically all you need to do. To show that a message will be executed based on conditions, we're going to use guard conditions. As you see here is a guard condition, and here is the same guard condition. And assert is going to work in exactly the same way. You can see here I have option and alt, and this is going to work like an if or an else statement. In this situation, we're just going to send these two messages in parallel. However, we are not going to execute certain messages if the guard statement does not come back as true. So that's really how that is going to work out there. And just to review the object constraint language, don't really need to worry about these data types, but these are the basic arithmetic types being addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, which is going to return the remainder, absolute value, minimum, and maximum. And really with comparison operators, the only thing you have to worry about is this guy right here is equal to not equal. And then you have your Boolean and or XOR and nots. And then we move into the random sort of things. You're going to create new objects or new participants in exactly the same way, except, of course, you're going to have a message number inside of here in a communication diagram where you did not have them in sequence diagrams. Destroy, instead of having an X, you're just going to put destroy inside of here, just like you did with the sequence diagrams. However, you're going to point towards the guy that you're ultimately going to destroy inside of the communication diagram. In regards to reference, SD technically stands for interaction diagrams. I know that doesn't make sense since this is an SD, sequence diagrams or whatever, but I have seen because there is not a specific way to reference other sequences of events, and these guys really aren't used with communication diagrams at all. However, like I said, I have seen people use things like the reference and critical and negative in exactly the same way with communication diagrams. I'm not saying that's right, but that is definitely something to look at out for. And whenever you want to define that a message has been lost, like we did with sequence diagrams, you're going to do it in exactly the same way with communication diagrams. Now to review here. We have a sequence diagram and we are going to show that the messages are going across. And then as we hit new participants, we're going to add an additional number onto that. And then you can see that I'm adding those additional numbers here and thereafter. How this guy right here is going to differ from a communication diagram is a communication diagram is going to be a lot more compact. However, you're also going to see the messages being sent. The major, major thing you have to worry about and figure out how to do is create these numbers right here. Everything else, for the most part, is going to be exactly the same, except there are no return arrows inside of a communication diagram. So you're going to have to really fixate on creating the right message numbers, which I hope I can make really easy on the next frame. Here you're going to see a pretty complicated sequence diagram. And by the way, I have all of this stuff available as a cheat sheet underneath the video. So click on that link and you can see everything there and use it as a cheat sheet and everything should be pretty easy in regards to creating communication diagrams because you guys seem to be pretty good at creating sequence diagrams. Here what I did was I labeled everything, this being the first message, second message, third message, fourth message. And then you can see as we hit a new participant, we're going to add an additional number onto that guy. And then you're going to directly be able to relay to these guys over here. And as you can see, I'm sending messages on both sides of the link. So there's the message one, two, and three, and message four, as you can see over there. And then you can see how these guys are bouncing back and forth. So part two, which is this guy right here, you can see how it is pointing 3.1 just as 3.1 is pointing to create this new participant. And then over here, as we bounce to a new participant, we're creating yet another number, which you can see that is exactly what's happening over here. And by understanding how these message numbers work, you can see the flow of the interaction between these guys pretty easily once you get used to working with it. So message one, message two, message three, message four, hits a new participant. This is going to be the next participant that is going to be created. And then since you don't see any additional threes anywhere, you realize that three 
memory has served its part and it is not going to send any messages. As you can see, no messages are being sent over here. Then we can go to four. Then we get to this participant. You can see the flow as well. And this of course will make a lot more sense if these participants had names, but either way. Then we're gonna go four one. And then because you don't see a four two until you come back up here, well, you know that that means that this is going to send a message and then it is not gonna send any additional messages until it ends up with the response or the return in that situation. So that is the major difference between sequence diagrams and communication diagrams. The major part is going to be understanding these message numbers as as I said before, because pretty much everything else is pretty understandable. But if you focus in on first message after a new participant, means add an additional number, and every message thereafter sent by that same participant means increment that number that you then added on, everything should be pretty understandable. Leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.